uh, our first speaker. Um, today, yes, the Brain Society thought we'd be a bit different. This is the year that everyone's being Augustus. We thought, well, there's another side of AD 14, isn't there? It's Tiberius as well. So we, we thought we'd, we, we'd look forward uh, to the future and Tiberius. And to start us off, um, it's a great pleasure to have um, Professor Catherine Edwards from Birkbeck, uh, well known for her many and varied studies of the social and cultural history of the early Principate and its reception. And I will not bladder on more, but uh, invite her to talk on the great devotion of our prefect to his mother, Tiberius. Well, thank you very much, Dominic. Now, first of all, I should apologise for not being Barbara Levick, um, who is sadly not well enough to speak today. I think she's originally going to, to head this programme, and I'm sure we all wish her in better health. Um, it's an honour, though one I'm scarcely worthy of, to be asked to speak in her place. I'm going to start with... Um, there we are. It's Olivia from the British Museum. So. Um, and then... Family tree. I don't know how legible that is. There's an awful lot of people on there. I mean, don't, don't worry too much uh, if the detail isn't apparent. It's mostly about kind of overall impressions. Had his mother, Livia, not been married to Augustus, Tiberius, we may surmise, would almost certainly not have been chosen to succeed Rome's first emperor. We'll leave aside for today the question of whether or not Livia had a hand in the deaths of Augustus' own grandsons, Gaius and Lucius, whom he had designated to succeed him, not to mention the death of his other grandson, Agrippa Posthumus, some time later. Sources also suggest that when, following the deaths of Gaius and Lucius, Augustus planned to adopt Germanicus, who was the son of Livia's deceased younger son, Drusus. I'm uh, getting pretty deany the... Uh, uh, I think that, uh, where is Germanicus is there, Drusus, there's dead Drusus there, and there's yellow Livia up there. Um, so Augustus had planned to adopt Germanicus, who was the son of Livia's deceased younger son Drusus, and also of Augustus' niece. It was Livia who persuaded him rather to adopt her own older son Tiberius, who had no blood connection to Augustus. Tacitus, for instance, reports, and this is passage one in your handout, for Augustus had considered putting Germanicus, his sister's grandson, and a man praised by everybody at the head of the Roman state. He was, however, overcome by his wife's entreaties, precubus uxoris a victus, and arranged for Germanicus to be adopted by Tiberius and Tiberius by himself. That's uh, Yardley's translation. This was in AD 4, when Tiberius was an experienced general of 44, while Germanicus, by contrast, was only 17. Suggestively, both Tacitus and Suetonius use military metaphors in conveying Livia's role. For Tacitus, Augustus is a victus, whose primary meaning in the Oxford Latin Dictionary is to defeat utterly. Um, for Suetonius, he, um, he is ex pugnatum precuus uxoris, taken by storm by his wife's um, prayers. This virile vocabulary associated with Livia implicitly unmans both her husband and her son. Nevertheless, in his brief obituary at the start of Book 5 of the Annals, Tacitus contrasts her compliance as a wife, uxor faculis, with her overbearing nature as a mother, mater impotens. That's uh, two on your handout. The story of how Tiberius came to be adopted by Augustus is included as part of one of several possible explanations of Tiberius' withdrawal to Capri in the final years of his own reign. And this is passage three on your handout. It's also reported that Tiberius was driven away by his mother's domineering manner, Matris Impotentia. He refused to have her sharing his rule, but could not remove her because he had received that rule as a gift from her. Augusta was continually casting this up and demanding her repayment. Impotentia. She has no sense of proper limits. She doesn't know when to stop. Suetonius, in his biography, characterises their relationship in very similar terms. And I'm sorry, I haven't time today to delve more fully into the many colourful anecdotes Suetonius includes to illustrate this insisting that Tiberius, much to his chagrin, was often reliant on his mother's advice. Now, Tiberius came to power in AD 14 as a successful middle-aged general. 
For him to seem in any way dependent on, rather than simply deferential towards, his elderly mother was necessarily humiliating. Was this charge merely a predictable tactic adopted by his critics? One might take the cynical, perhaps Tacitean view that Augustus himself had consciously or unconsciously engineered this situation. In his will, Augustus left his property two-thirds to Tiberius, but one-third to Livia. She was thus hugely wealthy, um, for a glimpse of how she spent it. That's a bit of the garden fresco um, from her villa at Prima Porta to be seen in the Palazzo Massimo in Rome. Livia was also adopted post-mortem, a striking innovation, and henceforth she was known as Julia Augusta, though you may be relieved to hear I shall continue to refer to her as Livia. When Augustus was declared by the Senate to be a god in September of AD 14, Livia and Tiberius took joint responsibility for the cost of building a temple. Livia was also appointed priest of Augustus, Sacerdos, again an unprecedented arrangement, though she'd early on in Augustus' reign been assimilated to the Vestal Virgins in terms of some of the honours marking out her position. Um, and there's, there she is, um, that fabulous uh, cameo from Vienna with uh, the, the, the now dead bust of Augustus. Ovid refers to her as coniunx et sacerdos in his uh, letters from Pontus, while Valeus Paterculus terms her priestess and daughter of Augustus, sacerdotem ac filiam. Um, and in terms of her, her priestly role, um, the, the uh, poses in which she's represented in, in quite a number of statues uh, seem to reflect this. So there's one from that's Tripoli and that's um, one from Herculaneum. Even if Augustus himself had no hand in the arrangements regarding his divinization, his will itself created a potentially problematic situation for Tiberius in elevating Livia in this unprecedented way. Livia's position had an established public dimension well before Augustus' death, of course, as Nicholas Purcell's classic article of 1986 so elegantly demonstrated. I've already mentioned the distinctions she shared with the Vestals. Her name was inscribed on public buildings, some of which she herself had sponsored. Um, her statue was to be seen in numerous locations in Rome and elsewhere. She was celebrated as an intercessor for and supporter of those who applied to her for help, um, and something most obviously celebrated in a consolatio addressed to her following the death of her younger son, Drusus. Yet this development, this new public role for a woman, was not something which only affected Livia. Mireille Courbier, in her contribution to a volume edited by Barbara Levick and Richard Hawley, um, has underlined how significantly the new family unit of the Julio-Claudians differed from the traditional patrilinear aristocratic family of Republican times. From 20 AD, we find references to the Domus Augusta, the, uh, the imperial house, suggesting official recognition of this new family unit. At the term, it may have been in use earlier, certainly the group of family members visible on the frieze of the Arapakis, um, and this figure in the middle, um, the female figure, is variously identified as Livia or Julia. In some ways, it doesn't quite matter which it is. Um, this is one part of the frieze, and then here is uh, there's another cluster of family members, including several um, women in, in um, this section too. Um, this uh, altar, which was dedicated on Livia's 50th birthday in 13 BC, could also have been um, described as representing the Domus Augusta. As Corbier underlines, most of the male family members represented here um, are related, sorry, most of the men represented here are related to Augustus, aside from the priests, but in every case, these male family members are related via Augustus's sister, his wife, or his daughter. So it, it, the female family members uh, play a critical part in tying these men back to Augustus. Um, and the somewhat hard to read family tree underlines that point further. I'm sorry, it's uh, not very legible. 
The succession of a new emperor, however, marks a critical new departure in how the imperial family is itself perceived. How did Livia make the transition from being emperor's consort to emperor's mother? What official role might the emperor's mother have? And how was this role viewed, indeed constructed, by contemporary Romans and indeed later writers? Tacitus, Suetonius and Dio, writing later, give a largely consistent account of Livia's role. I mean, there are sort of internal tensions, but they, they do agree in terms of what those tensions are to a large extent. They stress her extensive influence um, and her increasingly fraught relationship with Tiberius. I shall also look briefly at the rather different picture which emerges from Valeus Paterculus, a writer contemporary with and much more favourably disposed to the Tiberian regime, as well as um, at the evidence for their relationship as it emerges from some of the hugely important epigraphic material dating from Tiberius' time. It is, I think, however, Valeus' low-key discussion of Livia which makes particularly clear the controversial nature of her position and her potential to be invoked against Tiberius by his critics. The accession of Tiberius is where Tacitus, a century later, chose to open the narrative of his annals. Though narrative is perhaps not really the right word for an account so tortuous and knotted, Livia's influence over her son is repeatedly underlined as a negative factor. During Augustus' latter years, critics allegedly articulated their concerns about Tiberius as possible successor, and these include his mother with her feminine domineering nature, matrem moliebri impotentia, that word again in relation to Livia. Indeed, she's first mentioned in the annals in relation to her matris artibus, her maternal wiles. As Augustus' health deteriorated in the final phase of his life, Livia, Tacitus reports, summoned Tiberius, who just arrived in Illyricum, back to Rome at once. Her control over the domestic space of the imperial residence allowed her to control the release and indeed the content of bulletins about Augustus' decline and Tiberius' arrival. One version of events even suggests she herself hastened Augustus' death to ensure her son's smooth succession. The traditional division between the public realm of politics and the private realm of domesticity had been subverted. The transmission of power had become a family affair. In the wake of Augustus' death, those critical of the regime, hinting at the rumours associating her with the sidelining, if not disposal, of Augustus' relatives, are made to describe Livia as detrimental to the state as a mother, detrimental to the house of Caesars as a stepmother, gravis in rem publica mater, gravis domui Caesarum noerca. When Tiberius' role and the death of Augustus' last remaining grandson, Agrippa Posthumus, uh, looks likely to become a matter for debate, Celestius Crispus rapidly closes down discussion by making clear to Livia that she must prevent Tiberius from bringing matters before the Senate, also goes one version of events. So to the, to here, Livia is an absolutely critical figure in ensuring that um, the, the rumours are closed down around the circumstances of the accession. Tacitus characteristically leaves open how much responsibility for Agrippa's death is borne by Livia, how much by Tiberius, but makes clear how rumours pullulate in the festering atmosphere of the Tiberian regime. Tiberius himself, in Tacitus' narrative, on acceding to power, strikingly makes no mention of his mother. The Senate, by contrast, praises her at length. This is passage six on your handout. Much senatorial adulation was focused on Augusta too, some proposing that she be styled parent, others mother of the nation, and several that the words son of Julia be added to the emperor's name. Tiberius insisted that honours paid to women should be circumscribed and that he would show similar restraint with regard to those paid to himself, but he was really tormented with jealousy and felt that the promotion of a woman was a slight to himself. So he would not permit her even to be assigned a lictor and vetoed an altar of adoption and other such honours. 
uh, some dispute over whether he, he really did succeed in uh, forbidding her uh, a lictor. But in any case, um, in, the ta in the Tacitean account, if Tiberius is disingenuously reluctant to accept honours for himself, a light motif of his reign in t the Tacitean uh, account, he is emphatically opposed to honours for his mother. Anxious to please, senators have failed to realise this insistence on honours for Livia is tactless, or else they're doing it on purpose to annoy Tiberius by emphasising his mother's role in securing the empire for her son. Some honours were allowed to Livia, however. I've mentioned her position as Sacerdos of Augustus. Her name was included with that of her son in the yearly vows of the Arval Brethren for the safety of the ruler. Um, no. There we are. Um, the uh, obverse of this Cistercius of Tiberius refers specifically to Livia with the inscription SPQR Iulii Augusti um, and shows a lovely uh, carpentum or covered cart drawn by mules um, riding in such a carriage for public festivals. Um, was a particular privilege reserved for the Vestals and granted by the Senate um, a, as a special honour to Livia. Numerous statues of Livia, many on a colossal scale, are attested from different parts of the empire, which clearly date from after Tiberius' accession. Uh, it's one of Livia with the attributes of Heres, and this uh, enormous uh, statue of Livia from uh, Lepsis Magna. Some of these, um, not, not these particular ones, but, but uh, of this mass of statues of Livia, some uh, made date from the reigns of Caligula or Claudius, um, and that's something we'll come back to later. In the course of Tiberius's reign, embassies from different parts of the empire sought leave to honour the emperor's mother. Tiberius granted some requests and referred others to Livia herself. In the case of the, honors from, um, of the offer of honours from Githaon near Sparta, for instance, and this is a, a community with which Livia had a very long-standing um, connection, Livia was to make her own decision, according to the letter of Tiberius, which survives in an inscription. But some, such as um, the offer uh, made by the 25 AD deputation from Baetica, seeking to erect a shrine in honour of him and his mother, he simply declined. While Tacitus argues that Tiberius greatly resented his mother's position, Anxius in Widia, um, Anthony Barrett, in his 2002 biography of Livia, insists rather that the large number of honours Tiberius did allow makes clear this was far from being the case. Barrett does, however, concede that Tiberius may well have been uncertain as to how best to accommodate his mother's unprecedented position. Livia died in AD 29, 15 years after her son's accession to power. Tastus' epitaph for Livia... Stamp book 513 comments, she was a good match for her husband's craftiness and her son's hypocrisy. Tiberius, he underlines, did not attend her funeral. Seven on your handout. A wide range of honours to her memory were decreed by the Senate, but he, ostensibly from modesty, reduced them, accepting a very small number and adding that Livia should not be decreed divine honours and that such had been her preference. In the same letter, Tiberius is on Capri at this point, again, this is according to Tacitus, Tiberius refers critically to women's friendships. This observation is read as a dig at one of the consuls who'd risen to prominence through Livia's favour, but of course is also a dig at the excessive nature of Livia's own political influence. Dio, similarly, records the Senate's honours for Livia after her death with some further details. The senators voted to name her mother of the country and to build an arch in her honour, a distinction conferred on no other woman because she saved the lives of not a few of them and reared the children of many and had helped many to pay their daughters' dowries. Tiberius says no to the title and by proposing to take personal responsibility for building the arch, manages to prevent it from going ahead. In some ways, the most conspicuous demonstration of Livia's position in the state during her son's reign is offered by the events surrounding the premature death in Syria in 19 of her grandson Germanicus, a figure who evidently enjoyed widespread popularity in Rome and beyond. 
This episode is of particular interest since besides Tacitus detailed treatment, we also have a series of inscriptions discovered in Spain in the late 20th century recording public documents relating to the aftermath of his death. On his deathbed, Germanicus was said to have alleged that he'd been poisoned by Gnaeus Calpurnius Piso, this is according to Tacitus. Piso, legate of Syria and a close associate of Tiberius, had been in dispute with Germanicus. Also implicated in the alleged poisoning was Piso's wife Plancina, a friend of Livia, who'd been with her husband in his province. Back in Rome, rumours were evidently flying. A trial was felt to be necessary. In 20 AD, Piso and Planchina were both indicted. Piso, fearful of the outcome, took his own life, or at least he was found dead in his cell. Had Piso intended to implicate Tiberius himself? Stories circulated of the disappearance of an incriminating letter from Tiberius to Piso. But in relation to Livia's position, what's really interesting is the fate of Piso's wife, Planchina. Fragments of bronze tablets from a number of locations in the empire record the Senatus Consultum de Pisone Patre, the senatorial decree on the elder Piso. Oh. Yeah. Um, copies of this decree, passed some months after the trial, were set up all over the empire, something which suggests ongoing public concern about what had happened to Germanicus. These documents, fascinating for a great number of reasons, are helpfully discussed in um, 1907 JRS by Miriam Griffin, reviewing the edition of Ec Caballos and Fernandes of 1996, and they're also the subject of a, a useful recent book by um, Bert Lott. The Senate decrees um, that punishment be remitted in the case of Pisa's wife, Planchina, against whom many serious charges, plurima et gravissima crimina, had been laid according to the inscription. The reasons given are not only her confession, but also, and this is um, nine on your handout, seeing that our Prinkets has interceded on behalf of Plankina at the request of his mother, and that he has accepted as just the reasons set out for him by his mother, why she wished these things to be granted. The Senate judged that both Julia Augusta, who deserved the best from the Republic, not just because of the birth of our princeps, but also on account of her many great favours to men of every order, and who, although she ought rightly and deservedly to be most influential in the case of anything she sought from the Senate, used this influence most sparingly. And the great devotion of our princeps towards his mother should be supported and indulged. Mm. Tacitus notes the reprieve for Planchina, which he similarly attributes to Livia's influence, also adding that this was Planchina's reward for acting against Germanicus' wife Agrippina, to whom Livia herself was increasingly hostile. What's remarkable about the inscription is the language used by the Senate. Livia's contribution to the state is publicly recognised, optime de re publica merita, a, a formula conventionally applied to men who had held public office. Her influence is presented as entirely legitimate, a plurum in posse, jure et merito. While Tacitus repeatedly stresses the unrestrained nature of Livia's behaviour, the decree emphasises rather the moderation, parcissume, with which her influence is exercised. Ultimately, despite the senatorial decree, it must be the case that at least some of Tiberius's contemporaries continue to feel unease, perhaps shared with Tiberius himself, about the extent of, Ti of Livia's influence. Indeed, I think there's scope to detect a hint of irony in the decree itself. It is surely telling that Valeus Paterculus, an historian who insistently parades his loyal commitment to Tiberius, and we'll be hearing a lot more, I think, about Valeus a bit later from Eleanor Cowan. But Valeus has actually very little to say about Livia, although he does open uh, the Tiberian section of his narrative with a reference to her. Implicitly, he, Valeus rebuts the claims of Tiberius' critics that his position was owed to his mother. Rather, for Valeus, Tiberius is the obvious successor to Augustus his, for, because of his merits and virtues. 
it was only because of his own earlier protestations that Tiberius had not been adopted years previously, according to Valeus. Even Valeus, however, refers to Livia's potentia, though he insists she only used it to help people. Livia, he says, in all things resembled the gods more than mankind. Per omnia de isquam hominibus similior femina. Some have detected a hint of criticism here for Tiberius' decision to turn down the Senate's proposal that she should be deified, though Valeus, in strong contrast to Tacitus, does insist that Tiberius is afflicted with a proper degree of grief at losing his mother. It's perhaps significant that these comments on Livia conclude the penultimate chapter of Valeus' history. The issue of Livia's status and Tiberius' relationship with her, I would suggest, has a crucial bearing on Tiberius' reputation. The question of what part should be played by women of the Domus Augusta remained a fraught one. What was to be made of the claims allegedly made by Agrippina the Elder, sole remaining grandchild of Augustus, widow of Germanicus, at that point mother of six living children, that she was Augustus' true image, a descendant of his heavenly blood, Imaginem veram, caelesti sanguine ortam, according to Tacitus Annals. Connections through women would validate the claims to power of all three of the subsequent Julio Claudian emperors. When Livia died, her son Tiberius chose not to deliver her funeral oration. But for Caligula, who would succeed him a few years later, this was a splendid opportunity a chance to underline his own network of connections to Livia, his paternal great-grandmother, as well as to Augustus himself, his maternal great-grandfather. The Emperor Claudius, unlike his elder brother Germanicus, was never adopted by his predecessor or any other of the Julii, though his mother, Antonia, was the niece of Augustus. It's perhaps partly for this reason that he had Livia, who was his grandmother, deified in 42 AD on the anniversary of her marriage to Augustus. This is a coin of Claudius showing the Diwa Augusta. Nero, of course, was adopted by his predecessor Claudius, but also made much of his direct descent from Augustus via his mother, the younger Agrippina. Tacitus' account of Agrippina's influence has a great deal in common with his account of Livia, both of these mothers of emperors. One of the many notable similarities, however, offers an important qualification to the hostility which dominates Tacitus' portrait of both these imperial mothers. For, as in the case of Agrippina later, even Tacitus suggests things got much worse after Livia's death. And uh, we do have um, a bit of time because we are, um, uh, we've got a generous half hour for tea, so we can easily afford a few minutes to have questions. Uh, and um, people are also um, welcome to ask questions of, um, of, of Catherine should they wish to. Um, and um, could I just start off with one question? One thing that uh, I'm vaguely aware is is misleading is the way that if you go to the Palatine, if you look at, uh, at plans of it, you have the the House of Augustus, and then you've got the House of Livia. And do we actually know anything about their sort of living arrangements, and how far, if you went to the Palatine to see Livia, you were in the palace, or whether she has her own operation? And, 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 and how this quite works. Well, I'm conscious that Amanda's sitting here. Yeah. He's <laughs> way more about this than I do. Um, in terms of, because I mean, there's been say, you know, a lot of a very important recent work to which Amanda's a major contributor on, on, on kind of how, how the domestic space of the Palatine works. I mean, I think it's no longer, um, please correct me if I get this wrong, but I mean, it's, it's, it's no longer thought to be the case that there are these separate sure. houses no. lived in uh, simultaneously. Uh, by the Imperial family. I just wonder um, whether uh, uh, Catherine Edwards might like to comment on um, uh, what to me has always been a very um, uh, uh, 
moving episode, which was that um, uh, Tiberius was actually deprived of the love of his life when he was made to divorce uh, Vipsania uh, and marry uh, 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 Julia and become Augustus's uh, son-in-law. And the story, I think, uh, is told that some time after this happened, Tiberius caught sight of Vipsania in the street somewhere and followed her for some time and the word got out that this was going on and so orders were issued that she should never be allowed in his sight again. And it seemed to me that a lot of the, I mean that must have surely had a terrible effect upon him, uh, especially bearing in mind the, 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 the nature of, <laughs> of his new bride, as it were. Well, on my day, perhaps it had an effect on her being forced yes. to marry Tiberius, which can't <laughs> have been a particularly attractive <laughs> option. Um, yes, I mean, I, I think it, it, it is a, a very striking example of where dynastic politics um, involves people divorcing and remarrying against the will of the parties concerned, only doing it kind of under pressure from... From, um, from above, and, and that's by no means the only example in the imperial family of, of, of that happening. I mean, um, in fact, earlier on, I think uh, Mark Antony um, divorces one wife in order to marry um, Augustus' sister. So there's a lot of, of sort of uh, sense of, of, of kind of you know, dynastic um, or political um, need overriding any kind of, of, of personal... Um, interest and I mean, it, of course, there's, there's also the, the um, uh, that becomes almost a, a light motif of, of the prince, but one might think of, of Titus, who uh, gives up his his love for Berenice on the grounds that that's a, a relationship that is is simply not going to um, work for the Roman people. Uh, you know, marriage to a foreign queen is just you know, uh, ever since Cleopatra, it's really kind of quite clear that that's not going to going to go down well. So, um, I, I mean, whether that, um, how far that kind of contributed to, to Tiberius' uh, disposition is, is difficult to, to speculate, given, given the scanty nature of our sources. I think a, a lot of the members of the Roman imperial family had a kind of rather psychologically traumatic um, upbringings might think of Caligula probably you know, scarred for life by the terrible things that he had to go through in his early <coughs> youth may well have contributed to his, uh, his weaknesses as a ruler in later years. <coughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I think probably uh, at that point we should um, start our, our break and reassemble um, in time to recommence our lectures at quarter past. So thank you very much, um, Catherine and Peter.